How are you doing? My name is Lars Christensen, and this is the 10th episode of Ask Lars Live. This is the Sunday edition. That means that I'm just going to sit down here and go through a bunch of my emails and hopefully add some Fusion 360 value to you. If you like this, thumbs up. If you don't, that's okay. Thumbs down. And as always, I love your comments. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, I would truly appreciate it. Hit that little bell so you get the notifications. This just would mean the world to me. Jump into this. Now, the first one is not email. The first one is actually from Facebook Messenger. Now, I'm not too good at all the Messenger stuff, but this one was, was from Kenny. And uh, I thought it was pretty good. So let's uh, just jump in here and take a look at this. Kenny actually sent me a image. Um, so Kenny works for the city of Detroit. Uh, I'm actually going there in a few weeks. So I thought this was very uh, fitting. Um, and um, this is like sewage, water or something. And Kenny's question is, how do you, if you've got to model up a, this lid, Kenny have figured out how to put in all the bolts, but how to put in like this the web here to add strength. I have another image of it here, like these webs. How do you, how do you model those in? Um, so, uh, so, so they are in there. So you can kind of see they're clear. The, the the bolts goes through there, but then they're coming in here. So let's um, let me show you the dirty way to do that, Kenny. Um, so Kenny tells me. So this is Detroit. So we're gonna switch units. Let's go in here. Switch over to inches. And Kenny told me that this one is about 72 inches in diameter. So I'm going to open a new sketch. C for circle. And let's throw in 72. Hit enter. And uh, that's a pretty big, pretty big lid. Q for press pull, right? And uh, let's add some, uh, some thickness in there. Let's make it five inches. Um, now, to, to create this web... I think this maybe is the best image that shows it. Um, in here, I would actually take what I like to call the manufacturing approach. And what I mean by the manufacturing approach is to kind of work it the same way as you would do it if you had to make it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here over a new sketch on that top face. Uh, I'm going to hit alpha line or select line up here, whatever you feel comfortable with, and draw a vertical line up that snaps to the edge of our circle here, two point rectangle, make sure on the left side that it snaps to this edge and scroll down, make sure it snaps down to this edge here. Um, now I can use my favorite constraint, the symmetry constraint. So this point to this point with this line, and that's now gonna make sure that these are, are uh, it's gonna stay in the center. D for dimension, let's give this some kind of a with and I'm not quite sure how uh, how wide these are. Maybe they are three inches wide. I'm not 100% sure. Whatever. I'm gonna hit Q for press pull and uh, let's make another one of these. Let's make it three inches. Maybe this is a bit taller. Let's make it five inches tall too. So now we have kind of this crossbar here. Now I'm gonna do so. Like I said before, can you have already figured out how to do the bolt pattern? with a uh, with a pattern. I'm gonna do the same thing with these. I'm gonna go to circular pattern, not phases. I'm gonna be lazy and select feature because I have that feature right down there. And uh, I am gonna rotate around the center there. And then if I go in and make it an angle of 180, then I can actually go in here and do five of these, hit okay. And that means that we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if I click on this image and Kenny's image one two three four five six seven eight so we got the right amount in there um, now but here's the thing Kenny when we look at it now this is how you know you could have taken and 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 placed these and welded them on now you got to get that curve and the way I would get this curve is I would actually cut it away so, uh, you know, you put it up on a big lathe maybe and, and, and start cutting it away. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a new sketch and I'm going to open up on this plane, the vertical plane in here. Now, if you can't select something, remember, if you hold down your left mouse button, this little menu comes up and you can hover over and then you can select it here. Um, so what I'm probably going to do is I'm actually going to borrow these edges for a second. So I'm going to hit P 
And uh, I'm going to select um, these areas here, P for project. So I'll make sure I get these areas. Um, and uh, let's let's start out by by drawing a uh, let's drawing a line up from. Uh, actually, I probably want to hit P for project and actually make sure I get this line here too. There we go. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit alpha line and I'm going to draw. I'm actually going to draw a. Um, I don't know if I need this, but I'm going to draw a line out here. I suppose I don't need this one now where I projected that at. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to select a uh, an arc and I'm going to select the three point arc here. And I am going to select the midpoint. And then I'm going to select down on this line down here, somewhere where between the edge and where my bolts is going to end. So I'm going to do it right here. And that gives me a three point arc. Now I'm just going to place this three point arc right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that it's tangent with that line I just created. Boom. So now it's tangent there. Now, if I get out of this by hitting escape and get my white cursor back, you can see how we can move that. It's kind of stuck on that line. So now you, of course, want to do something like D for dimension and place a dimension from here to this edge and do that, whatever, um, whatever you need there. Now, so that was why I created that, that line there was to make sure I get a tangency on here. And now what I really just will do is hit alpha line and I will draw a line from that end point out to about here. Let's go up vertical somewhere, come over about vertical to that line there and down to there. And um, I would actually doing something like this. It is best practices to make sure that things are fully defined. Um, that is always the best thing. So I'm just going to do that. But what I'm going to do now, if we just go in an angle here is I'm going to hit um, go back to the solid. So I'm going to do a revolve. So I'm going to revolve this section and this section, right? See, there's our our arc there, and uh, I'm going to revolve that around the center line, and it could be the center line of this, it could be the center line of this, doesn't really matter. But that's going to create a cut, and now we end up having uh, that that cross there um, that you that you see on the on the picture. Uh, created in there. We'll click on this one here too. You can kind of see where all these meets, and uh, and that is now what we have uh, created in here with with that cut. Um, I hope that was uh, that was useful, Kenny. That is how I create that. And then of course the bolts in there um, to 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 get that that lid there. But super cool. I think it was a super cool little example on how you you can do something like this. So. That manufacturing methods of uh, actually doing all your extrudes first and then do all your cuts. That's how you would normally do something too if you were going to manufacture something. Um, so uh, I hope that was useful, Kenny, for you. And uh, I will be in Detroit in uh, in a few weeks. Um, so that should be good. Uh, get that all fixed up till, uh, till I get there. I'm just kidding. Hope this was useful. Thumbs up if you like it. Thumbs down if you don't. That's okay. This is just me in an attempt to uh, add a little bit more value to your Fusion, uh, Fusion 360 experience. Forgot the number for a second. Hope that was useful. All right. That was it. That was the Facebook. Let's jump to the next one. The next one here is from Anand. I'm sorry for butchering uh, your name a little bit. Hey, Lars. Great videos, very insightful methods. This is regarding your previous 3D sweeps for a bike frame video. You mentioned that using surfaces to drive and generate the 3D curves was kind of old school. I'm working on a similar project right now, and it would be great if you could give me an intro or something to about uh, you know, the methods that, that I would be doing. I think that is a great, great, uh, great, great topic. So let's just get rid of Kenny's images here for a second. Um, so what um, Anand is is referring to is that if we go to if we go to your YouTube and we search Lars Christiansen, that dude right there, 
And let's go to his channel. Play Do you video. use? Shut him up for a second. Um, if we go to videos, this might be the easiest way to find this. Um, we did a how to do a 3D sweet bike frame. How to create a chop not long ago. Um, and this was Jacob Anderson had uh, had done a video on how he did a bike frame. And uh, let's see if I can find it in here. Um, and um, this beautiful renderings. You should go and check him out. Uh, if you go and find this video, 3D Suites for a bike frame, uh, you can get all that detail. Um, but one of the things we did in this one, we used actually surfaces to create um, some some shapes that gave us the the bike frame kind of uh, in the end. And what I said there was this is kind of old school using surfaces. So when Anand sent out and says, hey, how would you do it? Um, I thought, yeah, that is probably uh, a, a, good, a good one to attack here. So what I would do is, um, and now there's going to be a bunch of, uh, of, of bike mechanics and bike fabricators out there who's going to probably be like, I don't know much about bikes and I don't. But what I did do was I went out and I found a picture of a bike frame because I thought I would pick something else that uh, what Jacob was doing. Um, so I have a picture here. And um, if I was going to model something up like this, I would probably actually use a combination between um, standard modeling and uh, between sculpting environment. Uh, so I thought we could talk a little bit about that. So what I would do was in here in Fusion, so I open up a new document, um, I would insert a canvas of our, of our motorcycle frame here. Let's go out to here and there's this chopper frame. Now, I actually don't know much about choppers. Let me hit okay to this. Um, I don't know much about sizes or anything like that, but if I right click here, I can calibrate this. And, um, you know, we made it a thousand millimeters. Is that is that too much off? Is that too crazy? I don't know, you tell me. Let me turn my audience back on. I would also right click, I would edit this canvas and I would probably place, um, I would probably place this, this picture somewhere where in the origin where it makes sense. And again, I'm not a bike maker, so I don't really know what is a good uh, placement for an origin. Place it there. Um, we, I would probably start creating some sketches. Let's create a sketch on this front face here, a 2D rectangle and um, and start placing something that's going to resemble um whatever we're trying to do here i don't know so there we have a sketch just right click and uh, move that can i would place this something so in this case here i'm kind of going parallel with this might not be the smartest thing maybe it's this area back here but my point is that um, I would do this first off and then I would probably start creating some sketches that um, additional sketches in here where I'm kind of working with this geometry. So if we open a new sketch on this face here, um, I would probably do there's probably, you know, something that goes through here and the, and this center line, I would make sure that I get that dimensioned to something that I know is is right and maybe it has a link to it right that's how a millimeter long um, start making some sketches here that maybe is somewhat uh, fully defined to your origin and, and what you're trying to do here um, maybe you would also have a line going down this um, this mainframe down here um, and that one maybe is also fully defined. So you can start um, creating some some uh, some parametric modeling in here that all fits up. And this is what the bike manufacturer, I would assume, will use kind of like as a reference to, to kind of building out uh, this frame. What you could do now uh, with these sketches was I could actually start creating some some construction planes also for this. So if I use like plane along a path and I select this line, I can actually create a plane right at the end 
of this one. So now I get a construction plane one. I could do the same thing again, plane along this axis. See how I have a plane coming along there, and that could be my plane two. So I'm making everything kind of parametric scheduling here. And then maybe when I'm ready, I go and I create a new component. That's my, it's gonna be my frame body. Um, and now I could say, all right, create a new sketch and use that plane one as my, as my sketch here and see for circle. And I don't know how big this is gonna be, 30. Move it over here looking at this here. Maybe it's a little bit bigger than that. 45 maybe um, and and this is just standard modeling I'm doing right now right I'm doing a standard extrude I can actually instead of do distance I can do the object and select that sketch point and now that component have this because this uh, on a bike frame I would assume that there's certain components on a bike frame that is not all bendy tubey stuff this one here maybe have a sleeve in it right uh, same thing with the back end back here that is some some plate, angle plate and stuff like that. It has been machined and stuff like that. Now to do the frame, and my sketch disappeared because I did something with it. Let's turn it back on. Uh, now I actually, and this is maybe more to you and then, uh, would go into the sculpt environment. And in the sculpt environment, by the way, you have all these predefined shapes in here. Um, and so I'm gonna go in here and know that there is a pipe. So I can select this pipe and I can select this. It's looking for the path. I can actually select this path here um, and it starts out giving you square tubing. Uh, but if you click here, now it's a, uh, a circular tubing and you can control uh, the size of whatever you want this tubing to be 35, maybe it's 25, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's 30, let's make it a little bit bigger. Um, so be aware of that you can you can actually do this inside of the, the sculpt environment here. Now, where what I really want to show is also um, a couple of different things. First of all, um, whenever you're working in the sculpt environment, where we are right now in this purple environment, I will actually normally do everything I can in here in sculpt. Uh, I don't create multiple of these unless it's multiple components. So this bike frame is all going to be welded together in the end. So I actually want it to be kind of a, a, a welded, you know, one one component, one, one thing. Um, so what I wanted to show you here is um, kind of that shape I did on the other uh, video, um, how you could do something maybe somewhat similar to this uh, more free form, not so constrained. So if I go up here and select the cylinder shape, and I'm actually gonna do it, I'm gonna select the plane down here on purpose and just sketch something out. Let's make this one about 25. Um, you will see that what I now got is this, is this ring sitting down here uh, in, in no man's land, really. Um, but now what I can do is if I right click and hit edit form, if you watch any of these um, sculpt videos before, you know uh, what, where I'm headed with this. Um, you know, I can select this thing and I can now start moving it around. And I'll probably use my, my view cube up here a little bit. And I could actually start dragging uh, this thing around up here um, and place this, this frame about where I think I want it here. I can even kind of bring it in an angle a little bit like this. Let's go back up on the top view. That's where I kind of think I want this frame to start. Um, and now I could go to the right view and we could double click on an edge so we select that whole edge. Um, we could align. One of my favorite things to use is this set pivot point what will let you set the, the, the pivot that you're working on. So, you know, I'll bring it down into maybe minus 20 degrees, whatever. I maybe have this kind of align that here. Just remember to hit the little green check mark again when you're done with it. And now if I grab this arrow, I could start dragging this down how long I want to make this. Um, and of course, if I want to change something, I can just hit the square. So, and this, 
this work here, um, as many people will know, that this is all about, um, you know, practice to uh, to be able to to, to work with with the sculpt environment. But um, now we'll go to the top view here. Um, we could start working with this shape. So now what we can do, if you hold down Alt, hold down Alt on your keyboard or the Option key, I can actually drag out a new section of the uh, of this here, and then you could start kind of using the band and uh, and move this, and just make sure that you're you're doing this in all dimensions because um, it will uh, do this in multiple dimensions on you. Um, but what we can start doing here is adding these new sections in here, right? Um, and, and, and start creating kind of the band we want. And uh, as I've said before, whenever I'm working in this sculpt environment, that uh, this takes practice. This is the more time you're spending learning to use this tool, the better, um, the better, you, the better you get at it. Um, so that's that's really really important um, to, to take the time to kind of getting more and more familiar with uh, with this tool now let's just look at the top here so you can see here how I'm kind of creating uh, the band going here uh, through here I'm just gonna stop here for a second hit okay to this um, so you can kind of see how I'm bending this pipe um, and again, like I said, the more you are spend, more the time you're working with this, um, the better it's going to be. So this is a lot of practice. Um, but um, what I wanted to show is I've used symmetry before when you're working on one shape, but also be aware of you can also do a mirror duplicate of your whole part. So that works very much like um, the duplicate we are using in a standard modeling environment. So now we have kind of mirrored these two over here um, and also be aware of that uh, you have all the tools in here so we can actually bridge uh, you know this shape here with uh, with this shape here um, oops I'm make sure we get them all uh, so we can bridge these together and uh, and form this here and then again you can continue working working with this right this is probably not my end result a little bit bent like this um but you get what i'm saying you can work with this and and make your bicycle frames like this too if you if you want to and what i want to show to kind of wrap this one up is that there is a thicken in here uh so we can select this shape here and if we do like a three millimeter thick inside or outside minus two millimeter maybe uh, then we actually give it a thickness and now it's a tube and the same thing we could do right click repeat thicken we could do the same thing for this one minus two and when i exit out of this um here let's just turn the sketches off for a second the cameras off for a second uh the construction planes whoops the construction planes for a second we ending up with tubes here and uh, and if we go into the component and do the bodies we can actually start combining them using the combining tool and we can turn uh, these into to that one body we probably want in there and we can trim it we can do all different kinds of things but this is maybe the other way and then to to do something um, like this where you could make multiple sweeps in different angles and uh, and things like that. So I hope uh, I hope that was was a useful little trick. So here you are actually combining, uh, and the sun comes on, overexposed. Um, this is a way where you're combining uh, the standard work environment with the sculpt environment, the free form environment. Um, and again, I can only say uh, it. I can't say it enough. The free form environment practice. That's the best advice I have in there. Going there, messing around. A bunch of videos out on YouTube about that. Like it? Thumbs up. Thump, thumbs down. And if not, comments, let me know. You guys are the best. Okay. Um, next one is from from Kieran here, Kieran Thomas. 
Uh, I am new to Fusion, but coming from SolidWorks and Rhino, um, and looking to do aligned measurements from targets of wheels to the top of a uh, chassis. Um, so can you do can you do that in Fusion 360? And um, Karen actually sent a image. I think I got the image in here. Send an image like this. So you have a kind of it looks like multiple um, components. And we have a circle, and we have um, a, a, we want a distance here. <clears throat> Let's take a look at that. So this is one of those that I actually might be missing something. <laughs> uh, so maybe if somebody from the Fusion Development uh, team or somebody is looking at this who know the answer, put it in the comment. Um, but let's just go ahead and create a couple of new components to start out. And let's activate the first component. And let's do a C for circle and draw a circle here. Q. Give that some thickness. Let's open up our second component and draw something else, something that is close to what Korean had here. Extrude that out. We're just going to let them interfere. Well, it's probably not the right thing to do. But if we go back to the first one here, uh, we can now see these here. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about the inspection tool up here as our, our, our normal tool. Um, it has uh, three different filters. Select faces, vertex, edges, bodies, and components. I normally always have it at a uh, face at vertex. Um, you can set your precision. From my Toolmaker days, I would always go one more decimal than my CNC machine could do. Um, you can set secondary units. Um, and then what you can do here is that, for example, if we go in here, you can select an edge and it will actually give you uh, the length. It will give you the radius, the diameter, um, and it will also give you where it is positioned compared to the origin. So if I just click out in space, I zero it out. If I click here, you will see we get a positioning here. If we select this edge, we will get a length of it. If we select um, another edge, we will get a distance between them uh, in here. Um, and then you have this two snap points um, that if you turn that on, then Fusion will actually, I, I don't know this for sure, but I think what it does is it breaks down um, the faces as it knows it in the background of the software because it will give you a midpoint here. See how it gives you kind of like a midpoint? You can hold down control. It will lock it into place. It will give you the midpoint of the plate, the midpoint of this edge, the corners. If you go and hover over the cylinder and hold down control, it will give you the end point, the midpoint of the cylinder, and this. So you can start measuring from there. So you can measure from this midpoint of this to uh, the point end point here. It will give you this diagonal line, and then you can turn on the X, Y, Z delta. And the X, Y, Z delta will take the distance and break it down in the Z axis, so that shows up there in 29, in the X axis, 310, and in the Y axis here. Um, so I use this one a lot, the X, Y, Z delta, when you are selecting a point. Now back to Kieran's, and this is maybe where um, somebody maybe has a better trick than I do here. The problem with this, the show snap points is when you hover over a circle, you actually don't get other than the center of it. You don't get that tangency down here. Um, and, um, and, and that's, um, that might be something that there's a trick to. I don't know of it. Um, but I think it's because the only explanation I can come up with is because the software is doing this in the background and just picks whatever it knows and it wouldn't know tangency down here. Uh, by default, I think that would have an algorithm in it. The only way that I've gotten by this Korean, and, and it, I don't think this is my my most proud, best solution, but actually what I have done is, if I have multiple components, in the top component, create a, a sketch on a face like this, and then hit P for project, and if you project both bodies, select bodies on here, 
then you get everything there. And now I'm just going to hit alpha line. And actually, if you hold down shift, it will actually create a tangency, if you didn't know that relationship. So you get that tangency line. Oops, I didn't want that little line segment. So now you get a tangency line. Now you can place a D for dimension from here to, to this line here. Now we'll come up and give you a warning that this is a, is, is a driven dimension. That means it's not driving anything. It's being driven the 28 point from this point. Um, and now you can actually go into that sketch here. If you right click on it and say show dimension, it will show up here. Now this is not, this is not great. Um, it's not as fast as using an inspection tool up here. This could be a great uh, enhancement for Fusion, I think. Um, the nice thing about this is, though, that if, you are, if your assembly ever changes, because we use the project and the sketch, everything is following, right? So if we are deciding to move bodies in here, uh, we, can actually, we can actually do that, right? So these bodies here... Um, this body here can actually can actually move up here, and if we capture the position, um, oh, because it's happening after it actually doesn't do it, does it? Move the sketch afterwards, then it updates. Look um, at time right now, so so this is a way that you can actually uh, make sure that you are keeping a measurement in there. Uh, by doing this project. So it's a workaround. Um, if there's somebody who has a better one down there, um, you know, put that in there. But again, I'm just trying to answer my emails here. I take them in order. Um, and uh, that's the best way that I have found to do that. Corinne, I hope this is useful. Thumbs up if you like it. Thumbs down if you don't. That's okay. Uh, next one here is from Robert. Uh, Bob, per se. In the United States, we shorten names. So this is from Bob. Bob Stewart. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, all right, so Bob has an issue with when he goes up to inside of Fusion and select the arc selection and try to pick one of the options, the menu disappears from the page. And it doesn't matter how slowly he goes up there, and as soon as he gets close, the panel is gone. Um, so if we open up a new document here, so what, as far as I understand, Bob, when we go up here, if we open a new sketch, going up to create an R that this menu don't stays put. It literally disappears. Um, and, and so you can't select something. That sounds like it could be a couple of different issues. It's probably a software glitch. Now, a couple of things to check is to go up and click on the help menu up here. And um, if you go up here, and you go down to about, no, hang on. Go to, oh, sorry, support and diagnostics. Click on this one and check that your graphic diagnostics, that it's set to better performance um, or better display, not better performance, and that you have, um, your latest graphics card driver updated. This could be a, a an issue with your graphics card. You can also go up to your name and go into preferences. And if you go to graphics over here, um, you can choose, you can actually you probably want a better performance and not better display. Better display will probably slow down, um, slow down the performance of your computers. Make sure it's a better performance and, um, and, and and see if that helps. Um, it could also be a bad install of Fusion. Um, one way to do is go to Fusion 360 support forum. Google that um, and try to post in here. There's some bunch of um, Autodesk people sitting in here helping um, in the support area in here. So this is a good way to post it up. It definitely sounds like something. It could be a bad, like when you install Fusion, something went wrong. Uh, I am not 100% sure on that, but that's where I would start. Make sure you have the, the graphics cards drivers updated. 
that um, you have it set for best performance, not display, and then go into the support form. All right, next one um, is uh, from Larry. Uh, hey, Lars, Larry sent me a file, Fusion 365. I normally don't upload those. I much rather want a screenshot, uh, uploading the files, bringing them in. It's a little bit of a pain in the neck. Uh, but um, <clears throat> working with Cam and struggling a little bit with feeds and speeds uh, using um, some Illumium 6061, um, so looking for possible some tips and tricks with that. And then how do you engrave um, when you have when you have something that's not flat, when you have a dome on a part, how do you engrave on that um, on that dome? Um, and again, I'm not quite sure exactly. We'll go ahead and play with it. So feet and speeds. Let's talk a little bit about feet and speeds. I talked about it before. I'm going to do this quick. But feet and speeds is really something that depends a lot on on your machine, on your setup, and on the material. So there is no great formula for this. Um, there's not a one point solution that's going to work for everybody. My suggestion <clears throat> has always been to create a relationship with who you buy your cutters from. So instead of going out and buying the cheap cutters on Amazon, if you're actually buying it from somebody, um, I buy my cutters from Lakeshore Carbide, other places, you can actually call them and you can ask for some general tips and tricks when it comes to feeds and speeds. Um, so the way to look at it is there's two things with feeds and speeds. There is a surface feed per minute. That is how fast the tool is traveling over um, over the, the material, through the material, it's a little bit like, uh, is the butter hard or is the butter soft? So if it was hard and steel, the butter is frozen. If it is aluminum uh, or wood, then it's sitting out in the sun for a little while. So how fast can your knife travel through that? Again, this has to do with many times with the material. It has to do with the size of the knife. Um, you know, is it a wide knife or a narrow knife? Um, and then um, it comes down to, uh, and the setup, then it comes down to, so that's surface feet per minute, and you can look this up online. You start out with something. Um, so if you have like a half inch cutter, um, in, in, in aluminum, you will run a lot slower than if you have, for example, an eighth inch cutter. And you might even run into a problem where the RPMs on your machine is not, um, cannot get up as fast as the book recommends. So this can be a little touchy. Then you have uh, your chip load. So how much chip can you load per tooth on your cutter? So if you have a free flute, a five flute, how big of a chip can you, can you bring on there? And I use a rule of starting out with something like a thousand um, of an inch, so 0 0.001 of an inch load on my cutter. That's my starting point because the chip load has more to do with how much power your machine got. Uh, so you can always bring that when you got your surface feet dialed in, so just set it to a thousand um, and you have your surface feet dialed in so you you're not seeing smoke coming and your machine is not screaming, then you can start playing around with bringing maybe the chip load up on that. Um, about the dome, let's get into Fusion 360. Uh, so let's, oh, Fusion 360, not Google. Uh -huh. um, so let's model something up here. Uh, I'm gonna go in here and see the circle. Let's saw a 100 millimeter circle here and let's just, Extrude that up something doesn't really matter now. Let's create a dome now This is a little bit like I did earlier in another video uh, where we did the, uh, the 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 lid for Detroit sewer system um, So I'm gonna go in here create a, a Sketch on the side. I'm gonna P for and project So I get all the uh, I want to get all the edges here um, alpha line and I'm gonna draw a line up here 
Now I am going to, um, I'm going to make a point here. I'm going to go ahead here and just create a, uh, a two point, a three point rectangle from here to here. And then you can kind of like trying to get it somewhat close here. I'm going to leave it under the fine. Um, I'm going to go in and do this, 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 uh, revolve again. So like this and, uh, and just do full around this here. Now we, we kind of get a, a dome. Now you see here how there's, it's hard to see, but there's a little suction mark right here in the center of this. And that is because in that sketch I just created, I did not make you know, something tangent. That's why I create that helper line before. So I just create a horizontal line out like this and place the tangency between these two uh, here. And um, now when I finish it up, we get a much nicer dome. There's still a little shadow there, but uh, this should be a lot better as a, um, as a dome. All right, uh, let's do an offset of this plane down here. So we get above the dome a little bit. And I'm just gonna apply some text on this. I'm not quite sure exactly what it is that uh, Larry is going to um, is uh, Larry is going to to engrave here, but let's do some text. So let's type in hello like that, and let's maybe make it a little bit bigger. Uh, we can move it around whatever we want here. Something like this. Fine. Okay. I'm gonna hit Q uh, for press pull, and uh, I'm gonna drag that right in there, and now we have this hello engraved on a dome. I hope this is helpful uh, for you, Larry. Now to engrave this, I wanna show, I wanna show two tricks here. Um, the first trick I wanna show is that, um, so just to get to the point, <laughs> that almost takes me a while, um, go into manufacture, do a setup like this. To engrave this, you are looking to use the 2D trace tool. What some people is going to be like, well, wait a minute, 2D trace, really? Um, yes, because the 2D trace will actually go follow in three axes. Uh, it's a little bit of a, it's a liar that it's in here. It should actually be in the 3D. Um, but since it's like 2D trace, let's go ahead and select the tool. I'm going to select the metric tool. I'm going to select a, uh, I don't know, we can select a chamfer mill here. Select that, actually, if we go back in again, right click and edit, notice that it actually has a tip. I wanna make that zero so it's actually pointy. Um, and now you can go in and use that tra trace tool and we can select these edges up here. Um, and if you're just looking to just trace around these, um, to kind of get an engraving in here, this works great, you can even Control if you want to be in center, if you want to be left or right, and, and, and things like this. But this tool path here, if we go in and simulate this, you will see that that will drive a three axis uh, around here. So this, I think, is what you possibly are looking for. Now, don't forget that in, if we go back to the design, that in, um, in the font, in here, we actually have stick font. So we could have selected that instead of just the, the normal font. If we right click and we edit the scats and we go in here and we select this text here, hello, we could switch that from an Arial to one of these stick fonts up here. I'm not sure which one is, is what, but uh, then you maybe would just project that down to, uh, to the surface, whatever. Uh, now, what I wanted to show in here that I have run into in the past, I wanna show you a little trick and hopefully it's good. And that is that before you engrave, you probably want to machine this dome, right? But what you're going to run into uh, when we go in here is that now if I go in and say, all right, I want to machine this and uh, you can select, I would probably select the parallel or maybe you actually selecting a spiral might be a good one for this because it is a dome. So let's go in and select a ball end mill metric and, uh, and let's go in and select the ball end mill. I'm going to select the small one two millimeter, uh, let's do a step over, 
My step have always been default by 0.25 millimeters. Um, now what you will see happening here, I shouldn't have made it that small. It's going to take a little bit longer to calculate. Uh, but what you will see, and it, to the one center. Oh, why is it not machining the whole, the whole thing? Hang on, secondary, secondary problem. Oh, the box. Calculate, calculate. Huh. Okay. Okay, I have, uh, oh, that's weird. What did I just do? Somebody right now is yelling at me and saying tool to the center of the boundary. So I use silhouette, so it comes right down. Oh, the center point. Does it have to specify the center point? That shouldn't be it, is it? Shouldn't I find that itself? Silhouette tool containment, that's right. Um, link from the outside clockwise in an outer limit. There's an outer limit. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, <laughs> I will not be beaten. Um, so there's an outer limit of this one here. It's kind of interesting. What I was going to show, Jesus, is uh, you see what happens here where it falls into to the lettering um, here. And you're going to tell me that, well, I don't want that because I, I want this to be a dome, nice dome for my engraving to come in. But Fusion is doing the right thing in the sense that Fusion is looking at machining the finished result here uh, and don't want to dive, but you don't want it to dive in here. Here's a neat trick that I have used uh, uh, before, and that is that, let's just get rid of this for a second. Um, if you go back into your design and we roll back to before we did, before we did our engraving, see this? So now we have the nice dome before the engraving was put in. Here's a neat trick. If you go into surface, you can go in here and you can do an offset surface in the surfacing tool path. Select that. Don't add anything. If you're leaving this as zero, it will copy the surface. Now we have a surface body here. Okay. Now, when we go back into our manufacturer um, and we go in and we say, all right, let's just turn, go into the bodies. Uh, if we turn the body off, we will only see that, that surface there. Now, if we go in and select our spiral and select our tool, then we're gonna do silhouette, make sure that we have that at 100, hit okay you will see that now it's going to machine this surface without messing with the tracing operation that is actually coming below here. Uh, you only need to do that once, right? Now you can actually turn the body back on. Let me just go back here and bring this back to where that was. Go back into manufacture. I'm going to lock this first spiral because I know that that one is actually good. Uh, and I don't want that by mistake to update that. So you're going to go ahead and you can protect it. Gets a lock on it. So that toolpad is still there. This one here, we could now go in and... So if you ever hit the regenerate button, we are not messing with the first one. Um, but that's a way to get a spiral toolpath that will do what you want it to do 
um, and still have the trace doing what that one was doing. Whew. I hope um, I hope this was useful. Thumbs up if you like this. Thumbs down if you don't. That's okay. Um, there's many ways to uh, to skin a cat when it comes to uh, to cam and engraving, but I definitely wanted to show that little uh, copy surface thing. I think that's a handy handy little uh, one there. All right, done with cam. Let's uh, let's get into some uh, STLs, 3D printing, thingiverse, all that stuff. The next one here is from Kathy. Uh, hey, Kathy. Uh, love your YouTube content. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, I've been using Fusion 360 to do some designs, and I'm trying to do something different now. I want to print the Stanford Bunny. Actually, to go out and look what the Stanford Bunny was. Um, and I think that the Stanford Bunny was what the teapot was for rendering software. The Stanford Bunny, I believe, I, somebody correct me in the comment area below, um, was 3D printer manufacturers test uh, on, um, on how good their printer surfaces, surfaces was. I'm gonna show you the Stanford Bunny in just a second. But, uh, so Kathy got this uh, Stanford Bunny from, um, from Thingiverse, Thingiverse, um, but feel like the ears are a little jagged. And actually said, excuse me, sent me an image of it. And I agree, Kathy, that doesn't look great. Um, so the question from Kathy is, I don't know to use mesh mode, to use patch modes, to use the sculpt modes. How do I fix this? And that is actually kind, I think, kind of an interesting topic to have. So we're looking at this ear of the bunny and we're looking at it as being very, very jacket. Now, what I did was I couldn't help myself. I actually went out to Thingiverse, found the Stanford Bunny, downloaded it as an STL. So let me just bring that in. Insert, insert and mass. Here was the high resolution Stanford Bunny. Um, and I think it was Jamil had created it to give Jamil credit. And I wanna bring in the biggest one of them. Look at the size over here. I wanna bring in the biggest STL there was. So it's gonna take just a, a, a quick second. And here comes this this bunny in here. Now, I want to show. I want to talk about a couple of different things here that hopefully is is, is valuable to you, Kathy, and anybody else uh, watching. Um, so, if we're looking at Kathy's image right here, um, this to me is clearly uh, an STL file. We see the triangular uh, shapes on this. Um, and many people know that I'm not a big fan of STLs. And when I say I don't have the big fan of STLs, this is where 3D printer people gets upset with me. That's okay. I'm, you know, um, don't get upset with me. The reason that I'm not a big fan of STL files, it's not, and I've said this before, but I'm gonna say it again. STL files is just a triangular mesh. We actually see that perfectly in Kathy's image, uh, triangular, flat triangular shapes in here. I'm gonna show you a couple of tricks. So, um, and then I get to your question, Kathy. Uh, but maybe, hopefully, all this is um, is is useful. So, what happens with an STL file is that if I have this glass and I convert it into an STL file, then it's just gonna throw a triangular mesh all the way around the outside shape, so it's normally hollow. There's no thickness to it. It's just triangular um, triangular shapes. Now, depending on the software you're using, and this is where I'm, I'm gonna start out by saying why I don't like it. Most of people who get, tri who get STL files are getting them from something else, and they have no control over how big these triangle shapes are. And these triangular shapes are defining the accuracy of your model. So again, if I take this glass and I throw a triangular shape over here, if I make a, so think about a carpet or a quilt out of triangular shapes wrapped around this here. If I only have 20, it's gonna be a lot more rocket than if I have 2000, right? If I have 20,000 small, small triangles, then it's gonna be a lot 
closer to the original shape and be be more accurate. Um, so that's the problem with it is that most people, when they're getting something, they don't have control over how tight they make these triangles. Honestly, and I don't know this for sure, but honestly, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe that the reason that 3D printers are using STL files is because in the beginning, when FDM printers like the Ultimaker I have, love the Ultimaker, it's great, but when they originally came out, 3D printers 25 years ago, they really didn't know how to make it really, really accurate. And that's why the, the Stanford Bunny, for example, the one we have on the screen here, was kind of used as a, as a model to, um, to show how, how accurate you could print something, right? Okay, so now I've said all of this. So that's my, my, my main reason for this is the accuracy of the model. The second point that comes to this is when you're using a mechanical CAD software like Fusion, like Inventor, like SolarWorks, and all of these mechanical softwares, um, they have generally not, I, I remember 10, 12 years ago, you couldn't even use an STL file inside of a mechanical CAD software. You brought it in, you could just look at it. You couldn't do nothing with it. Fusion is actually the best mechanical CAD software I'm, a, I'm aware of, again, the comments, mechanical CAD software I'm aware of to handle these mesh files because the problem is that I loaded in the biggest file of this and actually Kathy I would probably if I was you I would probably just go out and download this one because this ear looks a lot better than yours <laughs> right uh, but when you're zooming in you will see that this is many 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 triangles and cat software mechanical cat software has to solve everything every single point, every single face, every single thing. Um, so when you're adding a lot of triangles, it's gonna, the software is gonna bog down. So what, one point that is, that is important to understand is that we're looking at the head of this bunny, cute bunny. This actually is not round, right? It's just build up the finer these triangular shapes are, the finer it's going to be. So, um, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this just because I want to make sure that we get this straight. So mechanical CAD generally have not been able to handle um, a big amount of these. Um, so first of all, I know this is a mess. We can look here and we can see that this has a mess icon down here, uh, mess icon down here. Now Fusion actually has mess tool built into it. Um, and this comes back to you, Kathy, with your ear. Um, if you want to try to manipulate the mess file directly, I would not use Fusion for that. I would use um, Autodesk's Mesh Mixer. You can actually go and download Mesh Mixer for free. And, and many of the mesh tools that are inside of Fusion are actually, I think, are coming directly from Mesh Mixer. You can turn those on. If you go to your name, Preferences, and you go to preview, it's a preview option. You can turn on the mesh workspace. So you check that, and now you actually will have mesh tools in here. But you don't wanna do this in the history line. I'm gonna right click, and I'm gonna turn on the, I'm gonna right click on the top component, turn on and say, do not capture uh, history in here. And, uh, and click on that, and, and now I'm in the free form mode. You will see I get these mesh tools available in here. You can do a lot of great things in here. We could actually chop the ear off. We could heal things. We can do different things. One of the things we can try to do is we can go to the body. This is a mesh file. We can right click and we can say, I wanna turn, actually right click, highlight the whole thing, right click, and hang on, let's get out of the, sorry, make sure you're not in the mess workspace. Get back to solid. You can right click on the body here and you can say mess to B rep. So turning the mess we have here into a, a solid. Um, if I click on that and say, okay, 
it comes up here and tells me that this model had 270,021 facets. 270,021 triangles. Now, all you STL lovers out there, that's a lot of freaking triangles, right? If I had a quarter for every triangle. Fusion likes round about um, about the, the 50,000 mark, what is actually pretty substantial. So what we can do is we can go into the mesh tool and we can go in here and you will see you have all these different tools. There's actually a reduce. So we can select this whole body and say facet count and then we can change this. Now, the higher you make it, the more round it's going to be because of the triangle shape I just talked about. The smaller you make it, uh, the rougher it's going to be. I'm going to say this here to 49,000. I'm going to hit OK. Fusion, uh, Fusion is going to think for a second because they're actually taking this mesh body right now and it's literally making it down to bigger triangles. You can actually probably already start seeing that it is um, a little rougher here. Now, before I go any further, I want to show you that I actually, this model I brought in has holes in it. You see that? Has holes in it. Now, let's make another thing clear. Garbage in, garbage out. Good things in, good things out. What's well, actually going to happen with this model when I bring it in? Now, get out of the mess workspace, go into solid, right click. When I go here and say, mesh to b wrap it's going to say that it's not recommended but it can actually do it it's going to take a little while too you will see this is not going to come in as a solid this is actually going to come in as a surface body and the reason for that is again that there's these holes in the model so this is to 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 understand that now all those facets just became surface bodies um, there's ways we could have gotten around this, um, and now the whole model is going to work very slow because now it's not only keeping in charts of 40, 50,000 mesh bodies, it's also now have, you know, 50,000 surface bodies. That is going to slow, uh, fusion down here. Now, if I, if I just go back into our mesh file, Turn the mess back on, turn the surface back on. What we could have done was maybe have done something like a plane cut in the surface area in here. And what that means was we could actually have cut this body with a, uh, with a plane in here. Somewhere where uh, above that, that, um, Above that cut is so let's me spin this around 90 degrees um, and if I now do a uniform fill on the body then it will actually make this now a a solid now I missed the bottom here I could also try to patch it up I'm just being lazy now if I go in and take this and I now say turn this into a, um, a mass or into a solid, you will see that this is going to turn it into, uh, into a solid. So I hope this is kind of useful in the sense of working with these STL files. See, now it became actually a solid body uh, we now have, uh, have in here. So this should be super helpful for anybody who's working with STL files. Um, and, and now we got it in as a, as a solid. Of course, of course, if you just look at the 3D print this, then you would not have worried about um, turning this into, um, of course, into to a solid. Then you would send it directly to the printer. Now to fix the ear, to do that, um, just like in a previous video in here, that for me will become the form workspace in here. I would create a cylinder shape. And again, anything to do with form has to do with, uh, 
with how good you are at uh, at working with uh, let's make it like something like this um, form form uh, form a sculpt has everything to do with uh, with practice and becoming better but uh, what I would do is I would create for your ear I would create a brand new ear uh, Kathy that I would play in here I would place it wherever um, I kind of want it spin this around a little bit maybe make sure we get that shape wherever we want it that looks about right um, and if you're familiar with the sculpt environment you can now um, we can now start aligning things in different fashions with different edges uh, in here um, we can we can move things around um, move the handles around here maybe a little bit so they get somewhat around the edges of the ear and uh, and then we can start holding down alt and we can start adding as many sections as we want to uh, for this ear um, we can select double click on an ads we can select the whole thing and uh, we could now start you know maybe scaling the ear out uh, we could select one edge here and maybe we start um, dragging the edge of the ear in here we can close it up the sculpt environment is definitely the environment to um to start working with with this whole uh with this whole ear here uh, again don't forget about the positioning tools where you can you can start moving arrows in the direction you kind of want like that um, and we can start pulling the ear out and, and work with with the ear there and then in the end when you're all done maybe you hide the solid body sometimes so you can select certain areas redefine this so again watch um, what some of my other other videos on this for sure to make sure that you get um, into the sculpt environment and learning how to to use this but um, this is definitely a way to start you know if you got to start creating something as delicate as as a as a bonus ear was that too long did it did that get too complicated i'm sorry if it did um, just trying to add a little bit more value to your Fusion 360 experience. We see we already passed an hour here. I'm halfway done. It's going to be a long one today. Hope that is okay with you. If you like these live streams, really appreciate it. Give it a thumbs up. If you don't, thumbs down is okay. If you, um, if you leave me a comments, I read them all. I'll try to reply as many as I can. And if you hadn't hit that subscribe button, I would really appreciate that. Next one. Uh, so that was the, I hope that was useful, Kathy. I got a little long-winded, you know me. Jaden Stahl. Hello, Lars. I'm new to Fusion. Recently discovered your YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Jaden. Um, anyways, I really like your videos. It'd be a great help for me. I would like to model and sculpt, or sculpt, model or sculpt an airplane or a car, just for practice. I was wondering if you could make a video on how you would do it. Jaden? No. <laughs> Sorry. I am not going to take on uh, doing that. I have decided a long time ago. <sighs> Search out on YouTube. You will find some people. Probably use a combination of both sculpts and, um, and, uh, and, and modeling techniques. Um, my biggest reason for not doing it, just to be uh, completely honest, Jaden, is it takes a long time. And people uh, who are really good at doing stuff like this, I, I have a friend of mine who's great with alias. Uh, Flo Cohen, uh, Cohen uh, from Germany. Uh, this takes hours uh, to do, to sit down, model up, and I just don't have that time. So I'm probably not going to do that. Uh, next one is from Andrew Sketcher. Andy Sketcher. Hey, Andrew. Uh, hi, Lars. Great videos. I'm wondering if you could help me. I'm having trouble modeling a plug of an RC plane canopy. And he actually sent an image. Um, let's open that up. 
image looks like this. Uh, a canopy for an airplane. And um, I'm going to be honest with you, Andy. Um, you know, if you have followed along this far, you have seen me doing, uh, you saw me doing the bike frame and sculpt. Um, we also did the bunny ear in sculpt. That is also what I would use for a, uh, for some kind of a canopy uh, of a model plane would be using the sculpt environment. Um, you could start doing um, other surfaces and different things like that. But honest to God, I think that uh, you're much better off getting into the sculpt environment, playing around with it. Practice. Just keep working with it. You will, you will absolutely get it. Next one here is from, um, this is from Black Cat Forge, Aaron Armstrong. Um, I am a blacksmith here in California. Cool. Hope you're good for all the earthquakes that's has happened. Get rid of all the earthquakes. I am flying to uh, San Francisco on Tuesday. So just get them all out of it. Get them out of the way. <laughs> um, um, blacksmith is a pretty long email. Long emails are kind of hard for me to, 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 to digest. But brings up my uh, last live, 113th. We can definitely uh, just quickly call that up. So... Last line, let's do 113. So that is this one here on the sketching. This is definitely one that I recommend most people uh, taking the time to watch. I'm um, talking about best practices with sketch constraints and dimensions and things, things like that. Now, like I said, it's a pretty long email uh, from Aaron here. Uh, first question, I'm going to answer a couple of them. First question is in regards to spline lines uh, and, um, and, and dimensions, I think, uh, and, 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 and playing with them. So whenever you're getting into fusion, let's open a new document here, um, and we draw a line. So anything we're driving lines, I always would tell you these should be fully defined. So in this case here, it has a horizontal constraint. And if I give it a length, let's make it 80 that is uh, is fully defined now as soon as you add splines aaron uh, so hit the spline tool up here it gets a little bit more difficult so if we're just hitting a two-point spline here the spline has spline handles that can move up and down and go this way plus each spline point can move around and that of course also has its own own ones Splines, I will say, or anything that like you said before, or anything else like hand drawn, right click on it and just fix it. It turns green, it does lock everything down. What actually means that if I go back here right now and try to change this one to 50, I can't because these two are connected. So fix will lock everything down. It's a little bit of a problem um, when you're using fixed because anything else that was parametric before was not. So for example, if I right click here again and say unfix, now I change this to 50, now it will actually move it. But as soon as you right click and say fix, and you can see that everything turns green. I'm not, a, I'm not against it, you can absolutely do it, um, but you know, go ahead and, uh, and just know that you're messing with, with that when you're fixing it. What I'm not a big fan of is when people become lazy and, and they're drawing something else. Let's just draw something that looks like this here. And, and they decide not to dimension it, but they just, you know, highlight the whole thing like this, right click on it and just fix it like this. I don't think that's okay. I think that's cheating. I think that's bad habit, um, you know. And definitely, it's, I guess it's better than not fixing anything, right? Like um, leaving everything unfixed is, is the worst condition, I guess. So this is the worst because now everything can just move. You have no control over it. That's the worst. Next thing will be highlighting everything and fixing it. Um, but if you have these, these um, um, splines, I think it's okay not to try to fully define them. I hope that answered your long email now thunder starts here in upstate new york uh -huh. how about that all right moving on uh next one here next one is from chuck hey lars i want to thank you for your excellent videos thank you so much for watching chuck um 
So this one here is, I have a large assembly drawing of a small lathe. Now, when you say small assembly drawing, that makes you thinking a part file, not a 2D drawing. I hope, I hope that's right. Uh, we're going to assume that it's a large assembly file. Um, and I'm bringing it in from another, uh, another program like SolidWorks. And I'm finding that when I'm bringing the different files in, they're not aligned with each other. Uh, so the question is, um, it's very difficult to align or is the best way to do this. So let's talk a little bit about um, aligning here. I think this is a good, good, good tip. Um, is my microphone picking up the crazy rain? Maybe not. Whatever. Um, I'm going to create two components. We're going to make this little symbol. A new two different components. Right click. So we think we have an assembly with all different kinds of components in here. Let's make the first one active. Let's sketch something. Let's sketch C for circle on this one here. Hit Q and just extrude something out. There is component number one. Uh, let's make component number two active. Let's get something completely different over here to the side. Like this, extrude that up like that. So we have two different components coming in here. Um, now remember that components are just floating around. So if you're bringing in a file from another software, and this is one of the things that's important to understand is that if you're bringing in um, a SOLIDWORKS file, for example, into Fusion 360, what you absolutely can do um, in your tree here, you can just go and say upload. And, uh, and you, if you select a file, you can select all these different forms, including SOLIDWORKS and other file formats. But when you're doing that, um, Fusion actually don't uh, get all the... Um, Fusion don't get all the mates that is inside the SOLIDWORKS file. SOLIDWORKS don't let that go with it. Um, SOLIDWORKS holds on to that to themselves. It's not really Fusion's fault. It's just that's not brought over. Um, there's a couple of tools you should know about. Um, oh, there's Thunder. Um, <laughs> if we lose, if we're done, then we're done, right? Uh, but one thing I like to do is you should always... Um, fix one and I like to right click and ground one of them. So I'm just going to do um, continue here. Uh, that gives it that little thumb tag right there. Uh, so you can see that that one is locked down. Uh, the first component is locked down. That is locked down in space. Now that one will not move. I can't drag around. This one will move. And that, when we drag things around, that's when we get these two things up here, kept to position or not kept to position. If you say revert, it goes back to wherever you was. So if you move over here, revert back. But you can actually move over here and you can capture the position. Now it will stay. Give you that little icon down there. But they are still moving around. So you could actually capture positions. But this can actually be kind of handy because now if I move back, it remembers this. Where we were. I'm just saying that can be helpful. A hand, um, handful to have. I'm going to delete them all. Um, there's two ways you can align these components when they're in there. If you just want to align them um, from, from a standpoint, there is actually an align tool inside of Fusion that many people don't know. I don't use it very often because what it will do is it will just really align them. If I select it and we hit the component we want to do, you will see that it kind of picks up some aligning points. See that? It picks up the lining points. If you hold down control, it will be locked to that face. I'm holding down control right now. If I don't hold down control, it will actually try to figure out what I'm aligning against. But what I can do is I can say, I want to align this. Let's do this corner here with this center here. Boom. And they get aligned. Now you can flip the direction. You can change the angle on over here in the menu, but that will actually make them go align. I hit OK, but you will see that nothing happened in my history tree. The align tool is just that, is to align some components, but you guessed it, it hasn't fixed anything. It's just aligning them. So this is a good way, um, if you get your lathe in, there's multiple parts and you kind of like want them 
just line them up like so they look right a line is perfect but it's not attaching them for that we will use the joint tool um in that and remember if i just if we just go backwards where it's original position that the joint tool up here is i like it better than i like mates and solidworks for any of you solidworks users out there i'll argue with you all day long i use solidworks for uh for for, for many 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 years um but the joint tool is a little different in the sense that it kind of does the same thing right see how it's picking up different areas over here so if we hold down control again we lock it into that face and i select this face and then i go and select this face now this is where where solid users get a little bit confused but what is happening here is in SOLIDWORKS, we do refrigerator magnets. We do, uh, we align things by doing two faces together and then they can rotate. Then we select another mate to put two edges together. Now it can only rotate, it can, it can go up and down. And then we add a third mate and then it's finally locked down. We're removing the six degrees of freedom by doing that. Refrigerator magnets. Two here, then we lock it down. Two other ones, down two, right? Fusion does it different. Fusion removes all six degrees of freedom first. First. And then, when it have done that, then that's rigid. But now we could actually start playing around with releasing some of those um, degrees of freedom. Okay? So if you're not familiar with, if this confuses you as a new Fusion user coming from another CAD software, I've done a few videos on the joint command. Go and switch those out. So, to answer your question again, Chuck, the align tool is great to align everything up. The joint tool, that's the way to place it in place. So, on your mini lathe, when you bring it in, get the chart located with the joint command and then release the rotation and get the rotation on it. So, then you can kind of release everything up there. Hope that was useful. Thumbs up if you like it. Thumbs down if you don't. It's okay if you don't. Love the comments. Put the comments in. As thunder is hammering around here in upstate, well, western New York, I should say, here outside Buffalo. Hope that was useful. Next one. Next one is from Michael. Hey, Lars. Thank you for your videos. They have been immensely helpful. Thank you so much, Michael. I've been using that, but I've learned to design a parametric bicycle frame. I have it fairly well figured out for the front of the bike, but the rear has been a bit more difficult. I want to design the frame and have it all changed when I change the parameters based on the rider's fit. I love that idea. So using parameters, you have a bicycle frame, and then depending on how tall the, bri the, dri the driver is, you maybe put in his height, the bicycle frame will adjust to that. I know this is a bit vague, and I'm happy to share my drawing and any other information with you so you can see what I mean. Yes. There's no question in this email, Michael. I'm not quite sure what, um, no question. Send me a drawing as long as you're okay with me sharing it online. If you're not, then don't. Um, but then we might take a look at it. Maybe, who knows? All right. <clears throat> uh, next one is from Dan. Thanks for all the informative videos. Thank you so much for watching, Dan. I really appreciate it. Um, I drew up a tool shelf organizer for practice and decided to create a 2D drawing with dimensions Problem we're having is getting the right view. Yes, this one is good. This was actually one I answered also on Instagram um, the other day, and I'm glad that this one came from Dan so I could show it to you, because this is one I think is extremely uh, useful to know. Um, so, let's go ahead here. I brought in a file. Let me open it up here. Some of you guys are probably familiar with it. You hear the thunder outside? Uh, this one, anybody seen this? Um, now, this file here, if we go and say we're going to create a 2D drawing from this, pretty straightforward. Like this, coming up just in a second. Like this here. Um, we can place our first view, and we hit OK to that, so that gives us a first view. Then we can go up here and click Projected View. And we can create some projected views of this, whatever kind of format you want, standards, all that stuff. We can even do section views, right? So we can go in here and we can click and create a section view. 
uh, through this one that then will give us kind of like a broken view through here um, there's detailed views but what when there is a when you want a view and you can't get that view it's just not any of the default you're getting out of the projected view here is an awesome trick uh, let's get back into fusion let's get back over to our little electrical box so here's a trick if I move this one to a view and this actually also works for cam I've used this a lot there's a certain view that you really like to show so I'm gonna I really would like this view here it's odd uh, I know, but this is the view I want, so you can't tell me what not to do. Um, if you go over here, there's name views over here, and here are the standard views, but you can actually right click and you can say name, create a name view. And you can right click here, you can name it, so let's call it Lars, um, and you can actually adjust it. So if I move over here and do this instead, I can right click and update this name view. Now, if I save this file, you should always give it something. Edit named view. Like this, that is now a name view I can always go to. So at any point, you're working in your model. We are looking at it from the top. We are working at it, you know, from wherever. We can always go into a name view. We can double click on Lars. And it goes to that named view. <laughs> now, since we have saved it, we go back to a 2D drawing. You will now see that it flags us up here that it is has needed update. So I update it, and what have happened now is if I go ahead and create a new base view over here, if we go over here to the view orientation, drop down, look, there is Lars, and there is that named view that we can now place here uh, on on the drawing. So you can actually create. I don't even think there's any limit. So how many views you can add in here. This can be super helpful if you're ever getting into the manufacturing workspace in here. Be aware of that in here it has its own name views. This is super good when you're doing cam, you're zooming really in. This works if you are working in the sculpt environment, in sheet metal, whatever. Create name views. This was super helpful. Uh, I've used this a lot. Dan, I hope you find this useful. Thumbs up if you like it. Thumbs down if you don't. Comments. Hit subscribe if you haven't subscribed. It really mean the world to me. Uh, I really appreciate it if you do that. All right. Let's see if we can wrap this up as we are. I want half in. Uh, that was from Chuck. No, that was from Dan. Sorry. Drawings. Next one here is uh, from Jack. Um, bum, bum, bum. Um, all right. Here, also while I have you, does the mill turn feature work if you're only a hobbyist? and didn't or are not paying for the ultimate version, does this mean I will not be able to use my fault axis on my lathe unless I write the G-code myself? Um, no. So last week, let's just go back into our YouTube channel here. Um, last week, whoops, hitting the wrong button. We did a fourth cam uh video so this was fourth axis cam how to machine fourth axis uh, in here um so there is there is really um i'm, I'm gonna keep this short <laughs> can i keep this short there is really um only one flavor of fusion hold on here till you see there's really only one flavor of fusion fusion 360 um, Fusion 360 um, is free for hobbyists. You sign a one-year license, you can just renew. For startups who makes less than $100,000, and again, mark the date. Today is July 6th, 2019, because people are always like, is this an old video? Um, there's the hobbyist version, free for hobbyists um, and, 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 and startups who makes less than $100,000 or equal wherever you are in the world. That's free. That comes with everything except generative design. What is this uh, where you start using uh, the cloud to calculate your shapes with it? It's really, um, you know, kind of like um, now you're having the computer calculate shape for you. If you're not that, if you want to have generative design, that's 490, 
495, I think it is. That's the paid version for one year for have generative design. Plus, it, it costs cloud credits to run these studies because it costs Autodesk money to generate these because it's using Amazon Cloud Service. That's a whole other thing. For anybody who's a hobbyist license, you have everything except generative design. Um, so you do have the five axis, you have the fourth axis. It's all the same for you. You can go ahead and you can use it. Um, there's no limit. There's no nothing at that point. On top of that, there was just introduced like two weeks ago. Um, so on top of the paid version having generative design, you see I have that here. If you have a hobbyist license, you don't have this tab. That's the only thing. Everything else I'm showing you is the same. Then there is this extension added in here. You click on that, you can read more about that. <clears throat> so you can pay a little bit more and you get some new functions in here, but these actually have a price to it. We can talk more about this if you want me to. Send me an email and we'll talk more about that. But to answer your question, Jack, no, you absolutely have full fourth access. Um, Billy Frank sent me an email. It's a little urgent. I'm going to get to this. I'm trying to do split a core, a mold. And we talked about uh, doing sliders not long ago. Um, but two cavities splitting them in half, having a hard time doing it. My best suggestion to you is to go out and search um, cavity. So go to YouTube, so it's last question in Fusion 360 cavity. Go and find Lars Live number 80, um, where I created a core cavity from what I would call, in my world, a pretty complex shape. Looks somewhat like this here. Um, so go and check that video out, Billy. Um, search Lars Christian Fusion 360 cavity or last live 80 and you will find that video all right we're gonna wrap this up um next one here we had a hunt we all went hour and a half just me trying to answer some emails i hope this is valuable to you uh next one here i'm not sure it's octavian has sent me this is also about fourth axis um i make tool pairs like you say in your videos for mill turn uh but there's a problem in the post processor with the m codes I try free post processors, but my M codes are different and I don't know what the M codes means. Um, I have the educational license. Again, that doesn't really matter uh, for you. So what you want to make sure you do is go out, first of all, search Autodesk Cam Post Library. Google that. Get to this page. If you have not already, Octavia, Make sure you can filter down here for mill turn and you get all the available mill turn posts that is out here. Um, that's your first step. Now I'm saying that because this is where you're going to find your post. M codes are M codes that just stands for miscellaneous, what in English just means random. M codes are set up specifically by your machine vendor. Uh, so I have that Haas control running back there. Haas have set their M codes. Other manufacturers can have set their M codes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So be aware of that when you get M codes, it depends on your machine tool. So you got to have your manual for your mill turn machine and find out what your mill turn controller are using as M codes. Now you might find by using some of these posts as just referenced to that they are kicking out M codes that your machine don't even have or maybe don't even need. Um, and for all that, there is support up here for that. But just understand that when you see M codes, they can be random. So I have run on machines where, you know, M codes M87 meant one thing on another CNC means another. Heck, even for not controls, I think even uh, Haas also will let you create your own M codes. So you decide to add an air blast on your machine, you could activate that with an M code that you can pick yourself. So you decide, eh, M187 is going to be my personal miscellaneous code for that. That's useful. All right. Uh, next one here is, as my phone rings, 
Next one here is um, from Patrick. Hey, uh, first, I'm new to Fusion, um, and I watched a lot of your last lives very quickly learned. Perfect. Thank you, Pat. Uh, quick question. Is there a way to create a quarter section right angle cutaway of an assembly without having to cut uh, the parts within the assembly? Um, so uh, just to show here, I thought let's go in here and let's go and open up an assembly. Okay, so when we have an assembly like this mold I did a while back, I did a video on this whole mold. You can find it and it, it works, it opens up, stuff like that. Now, back to Pat's question. So is there any way to do a quarter section view? So we have the different sections uh, analysis in here where we can cut through in here and you can actually choose custom hatching for uh, custom sections in colors. You can play around with, uh, with the different angles and do different things. Uh, so you can do section views in here and it looks pretty good. Now Pat's question as I'm getting further in this email is, um, I wanna do a quarter section of it that I can then fully render an isometric view of it. So not only have something that looks, that looks like this on the screen, but actually also be able to do like a quarter section of it and then render that out. So go into the uh, render environment and make it photorealistic. Um, no, yes, no. I'll say no, Pat, there's not, but <laughs> there's always a but. You might wanna consider doing this in the new derived function because what you can actually do if you go in here and say derived is you could actually um, create, um, oh, hang on, just because I did all kinds of stupid stuff to this, I don't wanna save it. Um, what I would do is, I would do what you suggested, I'm gonna do this just in a second. Um, but I would go in and use the new derive function. What the new derive function will let us do is that the new derive function will let us select um, the whole design here, right? So we can let us select the whole thing and create a new derived file from that. So now I am copying everything over to a new design. Turn the joints off for a second. So this is a brand new file. And if I create a section view on this one right now, so let me open a sketch up here and let's do a, just cut this rectangle out like you have already kind of experienced, I'm sure. Let's do a Q, select all the things and let's just cut down. Oh, I wanna get those water lines that look pretty cool. there hit okay um, doing a cut like this right like a, a section view like this um, that you can now you can now render out but now you can save this as your your render out image um, and not mess around with this file though that if this file updates if you change some water lines this derived that you have will actually update with it. So yes and no, no, there's not a, a certain way because you actually want to go in here now and turn this into like a beautiful render. Um, but that derive function will make sure you're not messing with your original file um, and making sure that you're just taking a copy from it and, and, and work for that and you're not messing, messing with this. Hope, 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 hope that was useful to you, Pat. Um, all right. I think that might, let's do, do, I have one more. Tyler, Tyler sent me, uh, flattening out models for length measurements. Um, so this one of Taylor's, I have a couple of things I'm trying to do. I'm um, hoping you have similar answers. So trying to flatten something out, like I have a Frisbee shape and I'm trying to flatten it out so I can measure the length I will need for it. Um, to, so I, you know, 
can then fold it up and have it in the right shape. Um, we can only really flatten in the sheet metal workspace inside of Fusion right now. So if you already have like a Frisbee model, um, then you cannot flatten that out to measure. But what you can do that you might find helpful, going to this model we just worked with, is if you are using um, this, uh, this measure tool in here, you can actually, and I want to ask you to use your imagination, you can actually select an edge here, and you can get the length of that, and you can select another edge, and you can get the length of that. Um, or maybe better yet, if I just reset selection, you can select this curve, and you will get the length of the curve. And you can select another curve, and you will get a length, that will give you a position. If you select this curve, you will get the, the, select the curve, not the point. You will get the length of, well, why wouldn't it give me that curve? Hang on. I thought it would give you any length. There you go. So it'll give you the length of that. So if you're thinking about like on a, uh, you know, in theory, you are getting a part that that looks like a line and let's just give that a tangent arc right that's your that's your frisbee right there um and um and and, and what you're really looking for oh, so now i'm getting myself into i might as well do it if i gotta do it do it right let's offset this out here line from here to here all right here's my frisbee around this here so you're looking at this part here this was the part you got and you're like well i really want to uh i really want to flatten this so i can measure what was the entire length uh what you can do it is probably the easiest actually creating a new sketch, and I'm going to select a different plane that I sketched on, just so I can show you this. And if you hit P for project, and you project out these edges, if I now go and I select my measuring tool, I can select this line, and that will give me the length of that. I can select this arc, and that will give me the length of that. So if you add those two together, that will be those two flattened without what well, sheet metal would actually take the stretch of the metal in. Uh, so you couldn't be modeling in sheet metal. Hope that was useful. That is it for this 10th episode of Ask Last Live. I hope this is useful. Me just trying to go through a bunch of my emails. Uh, been on for about an hour, almost 45 minutes. Thumbs up if you like this. Thumbs down if you don't. That's okay. And uh, leave the comments. And until the next time, I hope you have an awesome, awesome day. Take care, folks.